wherever you may be, it's always time to praise God. So we're so thankful you can join us. Come on, lift up holy hands. Come on, bless his name. He is good. He is awesome. He is mighty. And there is nobody like our God. It is in him that we live, move, and have our being. And so today we celebrate the freedom and the liberty that we have in Jesus. Come on, put those hands together. You can move in your home. Hallelujah. Sing a little louder than before. Oh, 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 oh. I want to jump a little higher than before. I got to sound louder than before. Oh, Hallelujah. Come on and say, Freedom. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Oh, oh, oh. 
Where 
to say. There's a place my eyes can't see. Come on, the unison. There's a place my eyes can't see. Where my spirit longs to be. Where my spirit longs to be. It's a place of healing. If you need healing today, come on, lift up holy hands in his presence. It's a place I'm living freedom. Well, come on, right where you are, lift up holy hands in unison, say, I'm gonna lift my hands. I'm gonna lift my hands till I can reach heaven. I'm gonna shout your name till the walls come falling down. I've come to worship. I've come to worship. Oh, come on, bless his name. you, Jesus. For you, Lord, my Savior, King. Who breaks the sin that's binding. breaks the sin that's And binding. leads me to a place of freedom. Leads Thank you, Jesus.
Day to all of the mothers out there. Thank you for joining us today. To all of our Impact family, good morning to you. Happy Mother's Day to all the Impact moms and to everyone wherever you're watching from around the world. We bless you today. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, mom. We just want you guys to know how awesome and amazing and wonderful you are. This world goes around because of you. And we just want you to know here at Impact Church of Tampa how much we love you and we bless you today. Have an amazing day. Happy Mother's Day. Certainly, first and foremost, babe, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to you. And uh, our son is blessed to have you as his mom. And we're blessed to have you in our lives. And certainly want to say a hi to mom in Michigan. Love you. Happy Mother's Day to you. And uh, as I have the mic for the moment, I want to say on behalf of your children how blessed we are to have you as our mother and to have you in our lives. And mom, to you, I want you to know how much I love you and absolutely adore you and how thankful I am that we have this time in this season with you personally in my heart and in my life. And I'm, I'm enjoying this time from the depths of my being. And I say thank you for every sacrifice, every seed sown. Thank you for everything you have done and are doing for me and our family. Yeah. We love you. And to that point, where would we be, right? Without moms, your love and sacrifice, your giving, your mercy, your forgiveness. I want to tell you that there's no category of human beings on the earth that reflects the nature of our God quite like you. May you be blessed today and always. God's richest and best be yours. We thank God for you. Happy Mother's Day. Now, uh, with today being Mother's Day, I, you know, we have an amazing, awesome worship arts team that consists of part of what you see every Sunday through praise and worship. But we also have other aspects to that, and part of that is our dance ministry. And we thought it would be appropriate today to have uh, a presentation from our dance ministry as a tribute to moms all around the world. So as a member, Ebony, of our dance team comes now. Let's receive and be blessed by dance ministry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, mama, to my baby. Can you feel it? Angels walking in our midst and re it's revealing hidden ones with ancient tongues. The spirit is visible and the move is invincible. It's what we prayed for. All the days of fasting has paid off. My debts are erased and paid off. I once was in chain, now the chain's gone. No matter what it looks like, no matter what you see. I said 
Angels in camping, they won't let me die. They're ready to save me. My hedge of protection around me. The who shall surround me. That's all they can do, they can harm me. Cause I'm covered by the blood. I planted many seeds for the sake of the blood. I war for the blood, the night draw the blood. On the doorposts of sons, protect our loved ones. Find the shun ones, bring in the lost sheep. As we set the table, I'm prepared for the feast. As we draw near and prepare to release the blood. praying and you're fasting like the music demonstrated that has helped your children to succeed. We honor you today. You know, today um, we are concluding a series that we've been in uh, and it's fitting that today we'll be talking about one of, one of the women heroes of faith. I want to invite you to join me in prayer and, and then we'll look to listen to see what God says to us today. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to hear from you. We do honor you, Lord God, today and bless you. Thank you for this day that we honor mothers because we know that their heart of love and mercy and goodness comes from you. So today we bless you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to speak to us today. We have been praying that lives would be changed, that people would be healed in their bodies, minds and hearts would be set free, and that we would hear from you. We desire to draw closer to you, Lord God. We desire to see souls saved. So Holy Spirit, do what only you can do to your work. Be the great teacher of the church and touch hearts and lives all around the world. And for that, Lord, we're careful right now and thankful to give you praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving for all that you are doing right now and all that you shall do all throughout this day and this coming week. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Praise God. Well, once again, as I said a moment ago, uh, we are concluding a series that we began several weeks ago. It is called Heroes. And we're talking about Heaven's Hall of Fame. And, and the foundation, we've been reading all these past several weeks from Hebrews chapter 11 and concluding there in the Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Bible is very clear that they are heroes that are surround us and stand in the grandstands of life. And Hebrews 12, 1 says, As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and the sin which holds us so tightly, holds on to us so tightly. And let us run with determination the race that lies before us. And so in the grandstands of heaven, there stands heroes of faith, heaven's hall of fame that are cheering us on as we run our race for the Lord. God's desire is that we would learn from these individuals, these men and women, learn from the great triumphs and victories in their life, learn even from the challenges that they've experienced, and even from some of their faults and failures. But through the good, bad, and the ugly, and the Bible doesn't sugarcoat the lives of God's people, we can learn some things that last for a lifetime. 
and cause us to live a life if we'll take these lessons and apply them in a way that honors God and brings glory to his name because truly that is why we're here. God today is looking for a generation of heroes that go beyond and the status quo, that cause and influence others to dream higher, to aim bigger, and to step out and trust him at a deeper level. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, here's what it says about these Bible heroes. It says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that we through endurance are taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that they provide, we might have hope. So what we read about the ones that we've been studying the last week and others is that we might have hope and that we have, might have encouragement in our time. Because if God showed his faithfulness to them in that generation, and if God is a God who does not change, he'll show the same faithfulness to us in our generation. And so through Gideon and through Daniel and through Peter, we have learned that God is a God who is faithful. And through their lives, we can have hope. Now, today it is fitting because it is Mother's Day that we talk about one of the women heroes. And today we're going to look at a woman in the Old Testament whose name is Hannah. Now, here is what is interesting is that there is not a whole lot in Scripture committed to Hannah in the Word of God. In fact, there are only a couple of chapters. We know nothing about her background except the fact that she is a married woman and she is married to a priest named Elkanah. Now, she comes on to the scene in 1 Samuel chapter 1. She comes on to the scene and breaks into scriptures. And she's only there for two short chapters. But in those two short chapters of Hannah's life, we learn so much about a life of faith and a life of trusting God that are worth a lifetime of study. And so in 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 1 and verse 1, now there was a certain man from Ramathan Zophon, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, right away here in the text, Again, we don't see a whole lot about her background, but the text hints at something. The text suggests that Hannah's life is marked for favor. We see that because the first thing is, is the fact that Elkanah is practicing a practice of that culture at that time, polygamy, where a man would have more than one wife. Now, let me just pause right here and say that there are a lot of things in the Bible that are not prescriptive, they are descriptive. And here is one of those cases. That is, God is simply describing what was going on, but it is not a prescription, brothers, for us to apply today. And the church said, a man around the world, praise God. Somebody say, one is plenty, praise God. One is plenty. Well, listen, he practiced this, and it was a part of his culture. But the Bible suggests and hints that there is a favor on which Hannah is marked for. First of all, because she is listed first of the wives. Now, this is not a casual thing that we should pass by and not notice because first mention in Scripture is significant. Anytime someone is mentioned first, there is a significance that says that it suggests that there is rank and order. We know in Scripture, of course, the blessing of the firstborn. Jesus is called the firstborn of many brothers. And in Scripture is the first son who opens up the womb who is blessed with the double portion. And then not only does the rank in which she is listed suggest that she is marked for favor, also her very name marks her for favor because the name Hannah literally means grace or graciousness or favor. All of that is wrapped up in the name Hannah. And yet... There's an irony here because even though she is marked for favor and her very name suggests that there is a favor on her life, she is living with the contradiction 
because she is a married woman and she desires very much to have children. And yet in spite of the fact that she is gifted, in spite of the fact that she is favored, in spite of the fact that she is blessed, there's a part of her life that is frustrated. 1 Samuel 1, 4 and 5 tells us that the day came and Elkanah, remember, he is a priest. And once a year now, he would go up to Shiloh and they would have a time when all of the uh, priests and the men of God would come and gather for a special day of worship. Well, he would do this every year, every year, every year. And he would take his two wives and family up to Shiloh. And verse number four says, and when the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give, watch this, a double portion. Here again, the Bible is suggesting that her life is marked for favor. She receives a double portion for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Now, this is interesting, and this is a study of contradictions because on the one hand, she is favored. She is gifted more than Panana. She is favored more than Panana. She is loved. The scripture says nothing about him loving Panana, but he loved Hannah, and yet she is living without a desire fulfilled. And because of this, she was very grieved. She was desperately desiring a child, but she could not conceive. Now, let me just give you a little clarity about the way that reads there in the verse that the Lord had closed her womb. Well, it wasn't God that physically disabled her from having children. We have to understand the language, the mindset, the perspective, and the lens through which the Hebrew writers wrote about God. And that is their attitude is God is in control of everything. And so if something good was happening, it was attributed to God. If something bad was happening, it was attributed to God. They didn't think that God was bad. They just contributed that he was in control of everything. And so often when we read scriptures like that, that God closed her womb, it should be understood as this, simply this. She, for many multitude of reasons perhaps, was not able to conceive. And so in that, of course, this caused a lot of frustration. And it caused a lot of bitterness, as it would with any wife desiring to have children. God understands that. That is a sensitive thing. And I want to see how the scripture works this out and how God is speaking to us today and how God would be speaking to you today, even as a wife who is desiring to have children in the midst of this contradiction. It doesn't get any easier because what makes manners worse is the fact that Penina, the other wife, would taunt Hannah and would tease and would mock her for her inability to conceive. It was bad enough that she was living with the frustration. Now can you imagine the other woman, the other chick, Maybe even today in 2020 language, we might say she was his side chick because it said he loved Hannah, but she could not bear children. Now imagine this ride every year up and down from Ephraim up to Shiloh, verse 6 and 7 tells us in the narrative, and her rival also provoked her severely. The very fact that the scripture calls Penina the rival of Hannah tells us something about their relationship. Clearly, every day was antagonism central. It was antagonistic. Uh, it was adversarial at best. This was the condition. This was the state that Hannah was dealing with. She provoked her, the New King James says, to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb, or because she was having difficulty conceiving. She was not, had not conceived. And so it was. Watch this. Watch with me, verse 7. Year by year, by year, by year, by year, by year, she went up to the house of the Lord. She provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Now, I want you to picture this, because, you know, 20, 2020, they're driving up to Shiloh. And I'm sure it gets silent in the car every year about this time. 
because you got one baby in the back, you got two up front, however they're rolling, one's breastfeeding, so forth, and you know she's looking at Hannah, rolling her eyes at her, teasing her, mocking her, doing whatever she can to make her miserable. Well, this thing eventually came to a head. The scripture doesn't tell us how many years it was, but it said year after year, you put your sanctified imagination on that, and I want you to imagine the emotional, psychological weight and turmoil that this put on this woman. And she's dealing with this every year, every year, every year. And then it got to the place where she became so broken, so hurt, so oppressed by this frustrated desire with salt on the wound added by the other woman that eventually she got to the place where she is weeping, weeping bitterly, and she would not eat. She would not eat. And so it is in that condition that she cries. And what's interesting is that Elkanah, her husband, comes and he, he can't understand. He can't understand why he alone and he himself is not enough for her. Can I just tell you this, uh, ladies, wives in particular, uh, uh, again, I'm not here to beat up on guys. The world and the enemy tries to beat you up enough. I'm your friend. But can I just be honest? Sometimes we guys can be clueless. Sometimes we just don't get it. Elkanah could not get it. Sometimes it's a difference in our emotional makeup. It's not that men don't have emotion. Oh, yes, we do. Yeah, we hurt just like women hurt, but sometimes in the midst of life, we don't get things the same way that our wives get things. And so in verse 8, here's Elkanah's solution. He says, why are you crying? He said, babe, what's wrong? What's the matter? He says, why aren't you eating? Why are you fasting? Why aren't you eating? Why aren't you celebrating? Why are you downhearted? Listen to the insensitivity. Why are you downhearted just because you have no children? What? <laughs> Just because you have no children. Why are you, are you kidding? You have to understand. It is not any much different. Uh, maybe there are different nuances today. But every, uh, in the most, almost every situation, a married woman wants to have children. If you don't want to have children as a wife, that's no condemnation or shame against you. We're painting a generalization of the desire that God has put in the heart of women and to have uh, that family situation. Well, I mean, also on top of that, in that day, you have to understand that motherhood was synonymous with success and value in culture. And so for a woman to have children and even to have many children suggested and affirmed her great value, not only to her husband, but also to society and culture as a whole. And so therefore to not have children, particularly in that time, oh, I'm not getting political here, but I know, I know there's a whole lot of voices in our culture that think too many children is a problem. No, children are a blessing of the Lord. But certainly in that day, in that day, to not have children was an effect to not be successful as a woman. And you can imagine the psychological weight that that put on her. But here he comes. He says, why be downhearted just because you have no children, babe? He says, listen, I'm rich. You got the biggest house in the city. I mean, all your needs are met. I mean, whatever you want, I can buy. You can go shopping anytime you want. What's the matter? Why are you upset just because you have no children? That's in essence what he said. He says, listen, you got me, babe. And right about then, she wanted to smack him, but she probably thought about the consequence, but she wanted to smack him. He says, what about me? Isn't that better than having 10 sons? Well, Akana, as great a man as I'm sure you were to her and as great a provider as I'm sure you were to her, that was not enough. Because can I tell you that there are some desires that cannot be pacified or quenched by any lesser substitute? And that is the situation that she is in. And, 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 I, and, I, and I know that all of us, whether you're a man or a woman, particularly as a mother or desiring mother, you can relate to this. He just didn't get it. And I want to say to the ladies that you're desiring to have children as a wife, I'm telling you, God understands. And I'm telling you, this is why he put this story Hannah, of Hannah in the Bible. And there is hope for you. Yeah, there is hope for you. Praise God. But because of this, she faced ridicule. But there are lessons that we can learn from the life of Hannah. 
lessons from her actions and lessons from the heart of God that we can learn from Hannah's story. And out of this deep darkness and depression and anger and frustration, here's the first lesson. Here's the first principle. Hannah cries out to God in her despair. This is a principle. This is a lesson that we can learn from this shero of faith. She cries out to God in her despair. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, it says, She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She was deeply distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. Let me tell you what that means. This means this was a heartfelt prayer. When the Bible says that she wept bitterly, that wasn't a cute cry. That wasn't a pretty cry where you get a couple of, you know, Kleenex tissues and dab the corner of your eye a little bit. No, this was an ugly cry. She was crying and weeping bitterly. She was crying and weeping bitterly because she did not have her desire met. And so it goes on to say this in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and then verse number 11. It says, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give all, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all of the days of of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Now, you have to understand something, that when she's in this situation, what I love about Hannah is she cries out to God. She cries out to God. Now, you know, that's right about the time in an emotional state like that, that, you know, somebody, instead of crying out to God, could go ahead and get that gallon of ice cream. That's right about the time. Instead of crying out to God, you know, she could have jumped on the line with her gossiping girlfriend who's always frustrated and complaining. And maybe she would have felt good crying on her her shoulder, but it wouldn't have solved anything. That's right about the time when maybe someone could easily fall back into some old habits or some old actions and lifestyles that they vowed they would never get into again. That's right about the time when she could have picked up the phone call of uh, uh, the phone and returned a call to somebody who she knows she should have no business talking to. That's right about the time when someone could have reached for the bottle and now on their fifth glass of wine or whatever else substance they have. There are many things that someone could have gotten into in that emotional state, but Hannah cried out to God. She cried out to God in her moment of bitterness. And God became her answer. Praise God. And so, as a result of that, she vowed this vow to God. When she vowed this vow to God, she reached the point of desperation. And she reached the point of something that I think we all need to understand. And that is this. We reach a point of freedom and growth when we come to realize that God and God alone is our only trustworthy source. When God and God alone is our only trustworthy source, as much as Elkanah could do for her in the natural, he could not meet her ultimate need. And I'm telling you, we come to a place of growth and we come to a place of maturity when we realize God and God alone is the one that we must trust and put our trust in and our ultimate trust. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, there is no test, there is no temptation that can come your way or that is beyond the course of what others have had to face, the Message Bible says. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you to come through it. Now, let me tell you something. (laughs) This scripture tells us that if, if you're ever in a test, it simply means you're able to pass it because he will never allow you to be in a test that you're not able to pass. Thank God for that. That's a good place to shout amen. Now, I will tell you this. God will never push you past your limit. Watch this. But God will push you beyond your comfort zone. Let me say that again. God will never push you and I past our limit. But he will push us beyond our comfort zone. And see, here's the problem. 
because we confuse our pain and our discomfort with our limit. But just because something is painful and uncomfortable doesn't mean that we are at our limit. You ask any fitness coach. Come on, you ask anyone who is helping you to work out and helping us to get in shape. We get to a point, man, where it hurts to stretch or it hurts to lift or it hurts to bend and we want to quit and we want to say, I can't do it. I can't go anymore. Why are you trying to kill me? And you know what they say to us? They say one more, one more set. Push a little further. Push a little harder. Why? Because they know there's a difference between your discomfort and your actual limit. And we need to understand that God will never push us past our limit, but he will certainly push us beyond our comfort zone. And we need to learn that. We learn that, praise God, from Hannah. Here's the second thing. Not only does Hannah cry out to God, but here's the second thing that we learn. Now we learn from the heart of God. And that is the Lord does not despise human desires. The Lord does not despise human desires because watch this in 1 Samuel chapter 1, in verse number 20, it says this, and in due time, when in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. God does not despise human desires. I think we really need to let that sink down and settle down. Even though she was misunderstood by her husband and mocked by Penina, she was heard by God. She was heard by God. And that is important because, you know, if you don't watch it, the devil will try to use a scripture religiously and cause you to not stand and fight and trust God or, or make you feel condemned or bad about not being completely happy with your present state. Make no bones about it. She was not happy with her present state. But the enemy will try to come and he'll try to use 1 Timothy. Well, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Just be content. Now, we understand that godliness with contentment is great gain, but we need to understand that when we have desires as human beings and as when we have passions and desires, it does not mean that our desires, even when it comes to the point that we're frustrated that we don't have them, doesn't mean that that's wrong. And it doesn't mean that we are sinning in discontentment. No, God is not uh, frustrated or does not despise human desires. And we see that in the fulfillment of his promise. In fact, Psalm 113 and verse 9, and I want to pray with you right here. Watch this verse. It says, he gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Not only does he understand that desire, but then in Scripture, he includes this as a promise in his very word to you as a desiring mother. Let me read that again. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Stretch your hand toward whatever screen you have right now. I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we agree right now in Jesus' name. Every married woman desiring children right now, I speak to their bodies in Jesus' name. I declare Psalm 113.9, the promise that you make her a joyful mother of children. Father, bless the loins of her husband. Bless her womb. Bless every part of her body in Jesus' name. I declare conception, supernatural gestation, healthy delivery of baby, babies, and moms. In Jesus' name, we agree. Amen. So be it. Receive that in Jesus' name. Yes, the Lord does not despise human desires. What he does is he asks us to come to him and to bring our desires and our petitions to him. That's what he does. No, the Lord didn't shut her womb so she couldn't have children. She was having fertility issues. They were, and yet God answered her prayer because he honors human desires. Number three, here's the third thing that we learned from Hannah. She kept her word before God. 
She kept her word before God. What word Pastor Tom will remember? We read a little early. She said, Lord, if you just give me a son, you just give me a son, I'll dedicate to him all of the, all of the days of his life. All of the days of his life. And you got to understand what she is saying to him. Because her husband's a priest. Her son would then be in that line, in the priestly line. And what she is saying is, I will dedicate him to the Lord. I will allow him to serve God wholeheartedly, even if that means for most of the years of his life, I will not be with him and I will not see him and enjoy him face to face. Well, now God grants her her desire. And here he is. Here's Samuel on the scene. But what I love is she kept her word. She refused, watch this, look at me, to make an idol of her son. Because so often we ask God for things. And, and, and if, we don't, if, if we're not watchful, that very thing that was a desire, we can end up making it an idol. What does that mean, making it an idol? Well, our whole life revolves around it when our whole life is to revolve around Jesus. He's not to be a part of our life. He is to be our life. And everything that we have that he has given us, we need to understand it is a gift from him. And ultimately, we need to understand this, that children ultimately belong to the Lord. Oh, they are children in the sense, of course, they came out of our loins and we're to love them and care for them. And it's all right to call them ours, but we need to understand ultimately our role is to raise them up because they ultimately belong to the Lord. They are his gift to us. But she did not make an idol out of her son. I'm reading down from verse 21 through 28. The male Elkanah and his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifices and to pay his vow. But Hannah, watch this, she did not go up. For she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there every other weekend. Huh? No, dwell there when? Forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, he said, babe, do whatever you think is right and uh, wait until you wean him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she was weaned of him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. The child was young. The child was young. And notice the language there. The child was young. Not the young man, not the 13-year-old man, not the six young man, not the 16-year-old young man. The child, indicating this is a young person, okay? The, young, the child was young, and they slaughtered the bull. They brought the child to Eli, not the young man, the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as My Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. Remember that day several years ago? Remember that, Eli? Remember that, Pastor Eli? He said, yeah, I think I remember you. I recall that because I thought you were drunk. And you said, no, you're not drunk. You're just praying and and you're crying out to the Lord. She said, yeah, that's me. She said, well, this is my boy. This is Samuel. He said, wow, isn't that something? He said, well, she said, well, listen. Well, I, I, I gave him to the Lord. I made a vow when I prayed. For this child, I prayed, verse 27, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. And as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Oh, my goodness. After all of this, all of the frustration, all the rides up and down from Ephraim to Shiloh in the car with the other chick. And she had about eight kids, ten kids, and she couldn't have any. She was mocked and teased and frustrated and crying year after year after year. And finally, she now gets the one child. And you know the devil is saying, well, she got one, but you probably ain't going to have any more. So she now has to now complete her vow and give this one child up to Shiloh and to worship and to prepare for his life before God, I'm telling you, this is a lot of character that this woman exhibits. She's exhibiting incredible character and integrity of heart. She kept her word before God, but she committed to him. And just think about that, what that did, what she honored. We need to understand children ultimately belong to the Lord. That's the third lesson we learned from her. She kept her word. 
But now we come back to not only learn about Hannibal, here we come again now to see more about the heart of God. We already see that he does not despise human desires and human passions. He, not, he doesn't desire, despise the thing that you have a strong desire for, but he instead invites you to come and bring your petition before him. Here's the other thing we learned, that she offered God her best, but watch this. He then turned around and rewarded her with his best. Because now that Hannah has sown, as it were, this seed called her son Samuel, she now turns around and offers her to him. She has given her best. This is clearly her best. This is her firstborn. Remember, the first thing of anything in Scripture is important. There's a double blessing on the firstborn. She has now given up her very best. And in that sense, Samuel is a type of Christ who she gives up her only and her best. And so now in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, and Hannah prayed now. She's had her son. She sent them off, and now they're driving back to Ephraim. Can you see the tears now? That's her boy now. I mean, remember all she went through now to get him, and now she's leaving him? He's probably, most Bible scholars agree together that he could be somewhere between the age of seven and nine years old, training now for the lifehood of a priest and training at such a young age, she's a young child, and now she's driving back home without her only son. And you got to come back to the house with all these other kids. Now that is a trip. See, we read the Bible too fast. We read the Bible too quickly. You think you got drama? You think you got baby mama drama and all this? She got to come home now to this other Penina's other eight, nine, ten kids? And her boy is up in Shiloh after going through all of this. I need you to understand what's going on here and why she is certainly one of the heroes. But here's the fourth thing I said, that she offered her best, but God rewarded her with his best. But now in chapter 2, verse 1, the next 11 verses that I'm going to read, uh, your Bible might call it a prayer. I call it a praise and a thanksgiving. And not only that, if you read it carefully, study the Scripture, if you, you've engaged Scripture and prophetic utterance, you know that really she's starting to not only praise and thanks, but she's going to prophesy in all of this at the same time. Listen to it. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth desire, derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Can't you hear the Hammond B3 cranking up right now? Uh, talk no more very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bowels of the bowls, rather, of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full uh, have hired themselves out for bread. Those who were hungry and starving, they've ceased being hungry and starving. The barren has borne seven, praise God. But she who has had many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and exhausts. Again, that's that language of the Hebrew. God is in control is what she is saying there. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Brings them from the ash heap to sit with princes in the place of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For night by for not by might shall a man prevail. Praise God. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them will he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king. See, she's prophesying. Israel had no kings. What king is he, she giving strength to? She is prophesying about things to come. She is praising God, and she is essentially saying this: Listen, if you're downtrodden, if you're broken, if you're you're starving, if you're hungry, if you're going through right now, if you're going through right now, God is the God who brings back those who are going through when they put their trust in him. She has seen it for herself now. 
And now having seen it, she's prophesying. The anointing of God is on her. And she's bubbling over with praise and thanksgiving and declaring the word of God. And she's saying, he's the God of the comeback. He's the God of the late bloomer, praise God. I like to think of God as Jehovah, the late bloomer God. Wherever you come from, you might be a late bloomer. She didn't get an early start. She didn't maybe start having children when maybe ideally culture would have. But God is the God of the late bloomer. Praise God. He knows how to bring you back. You go back and read. She's not the only one that had fertility issues in Scripture. There are many women in Scripture, but God is the God of comeback. God is the God of the late bloomer. In Him, there is no time. Praise God. And so for those who will put their trust in Him, she is saying, those who mock, those who laugh. Ultimately, we know flesh and blood isn't our enemy, but we know the spirit beings are our enemy. And here's what this, these scriptures are saying to us. It is saying that God will shut the mouth of your doubters. God will shut the mouth of your enemy by showing himself strong in your life as you continue to trust in him. And then we come down to the last verse. It says, and then Akana went to Rama, and the boy was ministering. The boy, the boy. See, notice these intentional references to his age, the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Pastor Eli, the priest. In verse 18, following week now, but Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother, back in Ephraim, here's what she would do now. She would make him a little robe. She would knit him a little robe every year because each year he'd get, he'd get bigger, right? He keeps growing. And so she'd make him another robe year by year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So once a year, she'd get to see her boy. Once a year. And she'd have a little, a, a new outfit for him, a new ephod for him that she would make. Can't you just see this? And it is in this moment, Eli the priest, I called him Pastor Eli, it wasn't in that time, but you know, today it would be that way. Pastor Eli, he says, he blesses Elkanah, Watch this, and his wife. He blesses Elkanah and his wife and says, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Oh, my. Oh, my. Boy, you ought to be jumping in your couch. You shouldn't run on your couch, but maybe today it's all right. You ought to be running across the back of your couch. You ought to be jumping and dancing and rejoicing. Because listen, here's what, here's what I want you to notice, two things. First of all, first of all, he said, he said, the Lord give you descendants from this woman. Now, she already had Samuel, but he's prophesying other children. Why? Why? Because of what she loaned to the Lord. Let me tell you something. We used to sing a song in church. Where we grew up, Spiritual says you can't beat God given. It's an old song, no matter how hard you try. The more you give, the more he gives to you. You cannot beat God giving, no matter how hard you try. You will never be in debt to God. God will never owe a man anything. And, and when we loan something, as it were, to the Lord, then God repays back in his ways. Now, he may not pay back on the first, 15th, or the 30th, but when he pays back, he pays back many times over. So he is prophesying that, Hannah, I know you went through. I know it's been tough. I know it was hard. But not only have you had this one, but you're getting ready to have some more, baby girl. You're getting ready to have some more. And not only that, I want you to peep this because you might have missed this. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife. There's no mention of Penina anymore. After the fifth verse of 1 Samuel chapter 1, Penina is never mentioned again. I mean, not hating on Penina. That was Eli. That was Elkanah's choice. That wasn't anybody's fault. He made that decision. But the point that I'm making to you now is that thing that used to mock you, the thing that used to deride you and go and, and make you feel bad and miserable is no longer in the picture. Because Hannah's name means grace and favor. Now her destiny is being fulfilled. Now what the scripture suggested that she was marked for favor is now coming to be fulfilled. 
This is so important to understand because we need to understand is that you can be in situations where you are more favored than someone, more gifted by someone, not better than, but just more gifted, more favored in a certain area, and yet still experiencing frustration. But I'm telling you, if you're a Hannah right now, if you're a Hannah right now, the day is coming if you will trust in him that what you gave and lended and committed to the Lord, God will repay you many times over. Now listen to what it says. It says, they would go up then to their home, and verse 21 says, And the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Last time I checked, three and two is five. If you care and engage the study of how God uses numbers in scriptures, you notice certain patterns of 40 and 10 and 12 and so forth. And one of the patterns is five And it is collectively thought that five is the number of grace. And yet her name is grace and her name is favor. And yet here is God saying, okay, you gave me your one. Now, Hannah, grace, favor, I'm getting ready to grace you with five more. He's the God of all grace. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He visited her. Can I tell you that something happens when God visits you? (laughs) Yeah, something happens when God visits you. God rewarded her with a household of children, just like Jesus rewarded Peter with a a boat full of fish. Here's the fifth thing. She understood that she was responsible for stewarding greatness. Yeah, she understood she was responsible for stewarding greatness. Again, we only have two chapters on Hannah before she jumps off of the scene of Scripture. But in these two short chapters, we learn a lifetime of lessons. The book is not named Hannah. It's named Samuel. (laughs) She is forever known now, think about this, as Samuel's mama. And what a joy that would be to raise a young man like this and to put the right things in him so that he could fulfill the greatness that was on his life. Now, Samuel, talking about what's in a name, in the Hebrew, the name Samuel means God hears or acts of God. Well, when you put those together, she acts of God and God hears. So God hears our petitions. His name literally means that God hears and he answers. Samuel, this young man, she didn't just raise a boy. She raised a prophet. She raised a prophet, and he grew up to be a great man of God, the final judge of Israel during the time of the judges, and the man who would anoint the first two kings of Israel. That's all she did when she cried out to the Lord. I wonder what great man or woman is in your household. I wonder what they're called to. I wonder what great thing that they, all she wanted was a boy. God gave her a prophet. I wonder what's on the inside of what you cried out for. I wonder how great that young man or young woman is that's in your home or that adopted child or children that are now under your care. Wonder what their calling is. All of you as mothers are called to steward greatness. Today's Mother's Day, dads. All of you as mothers are called to steward greatness. You have no idea what that young man or young woman will become. Treat them as such. Pour into them the lessons that will enable them to rise up and be the men and women God called them to be. Now, let me just conclude with this thought here. And it's a question, and I want you to think about this. I I think the Lord will help answer it, but here's my question. Why was Hannah's story necessary? Let me ask that again. Put your spiritual thinking cap on for a minute. Why was Hannah's story necessary? I mean, think about this. Why not just start with Samuel in the tabernacle? Why not just jump to him coming to the place of his judgeship and his prophetic calling and just go on with the rest of the story? Why not simply have Elkanah and Hannah be a God-fearing couple? And just have an angel visit them. Said, uh, hey, Gabriel, yes, Lord, your servant hears. Hey, uh, there's a couple 
that's having fertility issues. You know how we did with Abraham and Sarah. You know how we roll. We need you to go down, talk to them, give them the word. One or both of them will receive it. They'll come together, boom, conceive, and we're going with our program. Okay, I got another couple like that. Why, why didn't he just send an angel down and bring them a word? They go ahead and conceive, and then we go ahead and go on with the rest of Samuel's story. Because it wouldn't be the first time he did it. He did it with Abraham and Sarah. He did it with Manoah, another judge of Mahola, in Judges chapter 13, the husband, father of Samson. He did it with, uh, with Elizabeth and Zechariah in Luke chapter 1. He sent an angel. Why not just send an angel? They're having fertility problems. You know what we do? Go down there. Do what you do. They'll receive the word. They'll concede. And we go on with the agenda. In short, family, here's what I'm asking. Why let us in on Hannah's pain? Why go through all of the drama? Why let us see her misery and her pain and what she suffered? Can I suggest to you today is that God wanted us to see this because God wants us to understand that even in physical human weakness, God can bring something great out of it. You see, God was glorified through Hannah's story. That's why we see it. That is why it is included in the scripture. God didn't cause the problem. He didn't cause the infertility. But he included it in the story for the Hannahs today that are listening to me right now. He included it in the story so that you can know that even out of weakness and, and out of pain and out of struggle, just like Hannah had, God is still a God who brings forth children. He's still a God who makes homes and causes women to be the mother of many children. And God gets glory out of this story. You see, every one of us, man or woman, we have desires that cannot be quenched by any lesser substitute. And it's through Hannah's life that God wants us to see that he does not despise our human desires, but that he, he calls us to petition him and he invites us to cry out to him in faith. If I had another hour, I call it violent faith because that was a faith that would not take no for an answer. And he showed himself faithful. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. Close your eyes in prayer. To the prophet Isaiah, he said, Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Rhetorically, the Lord asked. He says, Even though they may forget, I will not forget you, said the Lord. Father, I thank you that right now you speak that into every heart and every home and every living room and every place where we're hearing this right now. I just pray first and foremost that every heart will hear you. That even though a natural mother, though it would be everything against her instinct to forget her child, yet you will not forget us. So I thank you right now, Holy Spirit, that you are ministering to hearts to let them know you have not forgotten them. For some, it is literally Hannah's story. It is literally Hannah's story. We thank you by faith that, Father, from this word today, Lord, and from the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there shall be conceptions in couples' lives. Husbands and wives shall conceive and bring forth children, Lord. We thank you for that. Father, for others, it may not be a children. But it may be some area of their life where they feel like you have forgotten them. Father, I thank you that right now you are ministering to hearts to let them know you have not forgotten them. And while heads are bowed right now and, and while your eyes are closed, letting yourself have no distractions from the surroundings that are around you, I want to invite you to several invitations. Number one, if you're not in the family of God and you don't know the Lord, you don't have a personal relationship with him, I want to invite you to know Jesus Christ. I mean, how do I know, Pastor, what I'm supposed to do? I, I feel a, something in my heart. I don't know whether I'm saved. I don't know what prayer is. I don't know what salvation is. I'm going to tell you, I don't care where you're from, what your background is. Right now in your heart, if you sense a tugging in your heart, you just sense a need that what I'm saying to you in this moment, 
that you're supposed to engage and pray with me in that moment. That's the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart, inviting you to the family of God. And I want to pray with you. Number two, if you're not sure, you're unsure, but you sense, man, I, I, I think I need to pray. That thinking you need to pray, that's the Holy Spirit in you, moving on your heart to draw closer to him. Number three, if you say, you know what, I know I'm in God's family. There's no question about it. But I'm not in a good place with the Lord. I've let life happen. I've let things, situation, my own error, my own mistakes, my own sins, whatever it is. I'm telling you, God is not sitting there angry with you, rejecting you. No, in fact, the blood of Jesus still speaks forgiveness to you. And today I want to invite you to recommit your life. Number four, you say, man, I'm a believer, but my life lacks power. I want to invite you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and pray with me in just a moment. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, if you've never done that, you never asked to be filled with the Spirit, then that means you that's your need. That is your next step. And then others, you don't have a church home. And even while we're meeting in this virtual way right now, I want to be able to tell you what your next steps are. So while you're undistracted and your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, you can pray these prayers with me. I'll give you the words. You follow them. God will hear your heart. Pray with me, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, to save me now. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I, for, I, I repent of my own way. I repent of sin, things I know about and things that God only you know about. But right now, I come to you to be my Lord and Savior. I receive your love and forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And, Father, I come to recommit my life today. I give you the will of my life. Forgive me for living out of my own strength and my own ability. I come now and I receive your love and forgiveness afresh, brand new, once again. And I thank you for cleansing me from all unrighteousness. Now, Holy Spirit, I thank you for being my strengthener to help me to live my, a lifestyle that pleases the Lord. In your name, Jesus, I pray. And Lord, right now, I also ask that you'll fill me with the Holy Spirit till I'm overflowing. I'm asking you for that Acts chapter 2 Pentecost experience where I'm filled with the Spirit and I've received my heavenly prayer language also by faith. Thank you, Lord. Right now, I'm filled with your Spirit and my life and my prayer life going forward right now will never be the same in Jesus' name. And Father, I believe this is where you've called me to connect with and to be my church home. And Father, by faith, I take the next steps that are given to me right now. And I thank you, Lord God, that grace will begin to flow in my life in new ways just because I've obeyed what you said to me concerning my connection to this church. We give you thanks, Father, for all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, the first thing that we want to say is congratulations to you wherever you are, here in Tampa, around the world, wherever you are, God bless you. Congratulations. You're our brother and sister. And if this is the first time you've committed your heart to the Lord, welcome to the family of God. Now listen, something we want to do uh, for you, we want you to send the word connect, text the word connect to the, uh, the uh, number that's on the screen right there, text the word connect. What we'd like to do is turn around and then send you some digital information that you can respond to, help you know what your next steps will be. And we congratulate you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Congratulations. Well, at this time, we want to take this opportunity now to worship God with our giving. This is the time where we celebrate God's goodness in our life. We show the value that we place on the kingdom of God and on the word of God through our giving. I want to invite you to look at a scripture with me in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. And again, uh, Pastor Steph and I again say to all of our teachers, and we've got educators of all categories, administrators, principals, and all kinds of uh, educators, but particularly to those that stand in the classroom and stand before the, the students. This week was Teachers and uh, Appreciation Week, and we bless you, praise God. Hope you've been blessed by our uh, token of appreciation to you. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, 
As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but to put their hope on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which truly, which is truly life. So many rich things that are in that scripture. I love it that it says charge those that are rich in this world. <laughs> He's talking about rich Christians. Yep, God's will is for believers to be abundantly blessed. He said, just don't put your trust in the natural riches and the cycles of this world system, but keep your trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Then he tells us this, and this is what we're doing through our tithing and giving as my wife and I just did before this service, praise God, on our phone. You can see the ways that you can give there. But when we are giving this way, not only, praise God, are we causing others to be blessed and the kingdom to advance, but we're storing up riches for the future as well. In other words, and many live without this awareness that your tithing and your giving also has eternal rewards attached to your faithfulness, laying up a foundation, praise God, for the time to come. God not only honors and blesses you here, but he also honors and blesses your faithfulness eternally. Don't miss these opportunities to store up eternal treasure. Praise God. Well, I trust that we're all prepared now. Let's lift up our hands with an act of worship to give to the Lord. Father, thank you for this opportunity to worship you with our giving today. Thank you for watching over your word to perform it in our lives. Yes, by faith, not only do we expect to see the grace of God in our lives, now we receive it, but we also thank you we are storing up eternal treasure by our faithfulness on this very moment. You shall remember it, and so shall we. Now, thank you for uh, opportunities, checks received in the mail, unexpected income, divine connections, favor in business, and multiplying the work of our hands. In Jesus' name, may we see signs and evidence of it this week. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Praise God. Well, on behalf of my wife, Pastor Steph, and praise God, our family, to your hearts, mothers, happy Mother's Day. And all that are watching us, God bless you. We love you. Have a great week. In Jesus' name, see you next time. Bye for now.